Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and um, if this is new to you, and you'd like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, and so if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, um, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site, and there's a donation page that explains all their alternatives for people who don't like PayPal. Um, and thanks again to those who have been supporting it. My guest today is Kavita Chanayan, MD. She's a cardiologist, an integrative cardiologist, because she is also a meditation teacher, um, an expert in Ayurveda, uh, Tantrika. She became drawn to the direct path through the teachings of Greg Good, who has been on Batgap, and Sri Atmananda Krishnamenon, and has studied yoga, Sri Vidya Sadhana, Vedanta, and Tantra through the teachings of the Chinmaya mission. Sri Premananda, Sally Kempton, who has been on Batgap, Paul Mueller Ortega, who has been on Batgap, and Sri Chaitanyananda Nata Saraswati, who hasn't been on Batgap. Uh, <laughs> she blends her expertise in cardiology with her knowledge of Ayurveda, Yoga, Vedanta, Tantra, and the direct path in her approach to healing, enabling patients to discover bliss amid chronic illness. She's an associate professor of medicine at Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine in Rochester, Michigan. And she's the author of Shakti Rising, um, published last year, Non-Duality Press, and The Heart of Wellness, which I don't have a copy of so I can't hold up, which is coming out, actually just coming out this month or just came out or what? Just came out. Just came out, uh, yes. which is more of a health-oriented book. Um, Shakti Rising is uh, subtitled Embracing Shadow and Light on the Goddess Path to Wholeness. And um, well, first of all, welcome, Kavita. Glad to have you. Thanks so much for having me here, Rick. Yeah. Um, and this is an interesting book. Um, when you first glance at it, you see all these photos of, you know, Indian goddesses and you know with skulls around their necks and drinking blood and c cutting off heads and all that stuff <laughs> <laughs> And you might think eh, you know, I'm firstly I'm not a Hindu and secondly, you know, that's all mythology and, and Ooga Booga and, and it doesn't interest me that much, but if you actually read the book uh, as I have almost in, in its entirety um, you discover that you know these archetypes are um, symbolic or representative of a very sophisticated and subtle understanding of the mechanics of creation. And in fact, I bet you if a, you know, qualified quantum physicist were to read this book, he could, or he or she could draw correlations between a lot of the things that Kavita explains in it and his or her understanding of physics at, at the cutting edge of that discipline. Um, so. It's, um, it's a credit to Kavita, I think, for ferreting out the implications of these archetypes and also from uh, credit to the tradition from which they come for understanding so deeply the mechanics of creation and portraying them in, um, in a sort of artistic uh, or archetypical form, which you know probably most scholars have dismissed as, as you know, quaint mythology, but which is really profound and significant. Anyway, that's a bit of a mouthful, but um, what do you think? Is that a fair assessment of what I, what you intended to convey in the book? Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely right on target. Good. Um, another thing that, well, well, I have a lot, four pages of notes here, so we're going to spend a couple hours getting into all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, but one thing that struck me fairly soon in reading the book and was actually mentioned in the bio that I just read is direct path. And uh, I actually moderated a panel discussion on the direct versus progressive paths at the Science and Non-Duality Conference last October. And, mm -hmm. um, and I felt like in reading your book and hearing your explanation of direct path that I, I gained a much better understanding of what that term actually means, um, even though I prepared for and moderated that panel. Um, maybe 
just for starters, we could start in many places, but why don't you define what is meant by direct path as contrasted with progressive path? Sure. Um, so the progressive paths, you know, are um, the paths that most of us are familiar with, yoga and tantra and mm -hmm. even Vedanta to a large extent, because they start with the assumption um, that who we are is this limited body mind and that we are going towards a goal of remembering or discovering the self. Whereas the direct path actually starts with the premise that we are already that. And so what happens if you stand in your direct experience, um, you know, devoid of conditioning or devoid of stories, and if you were just to look at your direct experience alone, what would that look like? For instance, if you were to look at an object, you know, without any of the labeling that occurs uh, regarding the object, what would happen to th that object if we took a stand as the self or awareness? And so the stand from which we approach a path is, is what determines whether it's progressive or the direct path. Because ultimately, even in the progressive paths, at no point are we ever separate from awareness. We're always that, but it's just, we begin with the, uh, you know, with the goal seemingly in in the future that we are going to discover that. Whereas here we start with that premise already. Is there an overlap? Can the direct path, is the direct path progressive and is the progressive path or can it be in some respects direct? Yeah, so, you know, the direct path, it's, it's very interesting um, because Greg, you know, who is really my teacher in the direct path, will say and Greg that Good. Greg Good uh, will say that even to have arrived at the direct path, most people have done years of practice in the progressive paths it, because it's such a subtle thing to, to tell somebody who is, is not familiar at all with this and say now take a stand as awareness that's a very <laughs> that's it's a very subtle thing so it makes sense only after years of having studied in the progressive paths suddenly it makes sense right yeah. so that was actually going to be and, my question you know because people think they hear about this and they think hey why not the direct path why why goof around for a decade i, I just as soon you know get right on to it and then you have yeah. all these people that have read some Vedanta books and, and so on, uh, proclaiming themselves already enlightened and everybody's already enlightened and you don't have to do anything and, and you know, going on and on in, in internet chat groups. And so I, <laughs> I, I must admit that I developed a bit of a resentment or bias against, <laughs> against yeah. that sort of um, angle. Uh, but anyway, it's, go ahead. So, uh, you know, I think it's really important to clarify that the direct path isn't Neo Vedanta, right. you know, which is neo, what you, neo you were Advaita, just, right. uh, yeah, ne, the Neo Advaita, which is there's nobody to do anything. Right. It, it never says that, you know, mm -hmm. the direct path in the tradition of Sri Atman and the Krishna men, and it never talks about any of that. It's just saying, you know, well, what is really happening in your direct experience right now? And so it, it goes through a very uh, systematic process of looking at the world, looking at our bodies, looking at, you know, objects of um, the, the sense objects and so on in, in purely the direct experience. And um, so it's tempting to think that the direct path is somehow going to be shorter. It isn't. You know, just because it's direct is, is doesn't mean that somehow you're going to be enlightened in this moment. Um, there is still a lot of work to do because taking a stand as awareness isn't something that comes naturally to most of us. And so taking a stand there and doing the inquiry is a process. It is progressive in that way. Yeah, when you say taking a stand as awareness, what comes to my mind is that many people might try to do that and end up being manipulative of their experience, yes. you know, like they're they're driving the car or they're shopping or they're having a dinner conversation. And part of their mind is trying to kind of take a stand as awareness as, as they're doing that, which in my understanding would divide the mind and divide the attention and not be helpful. Absolutely. So, 
You know, this is not something that Greg says, um, you know, in his teachings of the direct path, but something that I feel as a long term meditator and a proponent of meditation for various reasons that, you know, that taking a stand as of awareness actually becomes more natural when we have cultivated the witnessing ability. Yeah. which is something that happens with a long term deep meditation practice mm -hmm. um, and, and that, you know, the, in the context of inner silence, that makes more sense. Otherwise, exactly as you said, you know, we're manipulating experience to think that we are standing as awareness, whereas actually it's all mental noise. Yeah. And when you say witnessing ability, um, I think of witnessing more as a natural condition that um, mm -hmm. develops eventually rather than a skill that one acquires. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if witnessing is genuine, it's not some attitude that one adopts or some manipulation that one tries to continue throughout the day or anything. Uh, it, but it's a it's a, just a way of being where you could be involved in dynamic activity and yet there's this pure silence and this a sense of a very distinct sense of uninvolvement because pure silence is uninvolved in activity and it could yeah. and it should ultimately ideally eventually persist throughout sleep um, so yes. you, you couldn't manipulate that yes absolutely and so and and that can't be faked it right. can't it's not it can't be uh, adopted, as you said, but it's something that kind of naturally unfolds over a long-term meditation practice. Wouldn't you agree? As a long-term meditator, yeah, it does. Yeah, and I was in, I was interviewing a guy one time. We got onto this topic, and he said, "Oh, I can witness any time." And then he said, "Here, watch. I'll show you." And he kind of went into this spacey, detached sort of thing, like he wasn't all there. And I thought, you know, that's not witnessing <laughs> as I understand it. <laughs> no, that's not how I understand it either. It's. Yeah. Uh, and and this is the thing, you know, it's, um, you know, I'm sure we'll get into this, but, uh, you know, Tantra is, is this uh, science of absolute intimacy with experience. However, to get there, we first need to create that space between the subject and the object, you know, which is what witnessing does. Mm -hmm. And we, we need that space in order to be able to look at our own processes. Uh, we need that space yeah. to stand back. And that's really what witnessing uh, cultivate. I mean, it provides, you know, over time. So would you say that you or, or one uh, would do something to cultivate that space between subject and object? Or would you say that that's something that one eventually notices uh, uh, after sufficient practice? I think it was one, uh, it just happens, just happens. Over, over time. So over time with a cult, you know, with a dedicated uh, meditation practice and I say meditation practice because that's what worked for me mm -hmm. and works for people I know um, for the people I teach meditation to and there may be other things that work for other people but this is something that that I know works very effectively effectively yeah um, and just to kind of well clarify it more maybe um, you know, when we say subject and object, well, what do you mean by subject when you say subject? We know what we, what we mean by objects, trees and dogs and everything, but what is what do you mean by subject between which there's going to be a space, that and, and objects? Yeah, so, um, you know, when we think about objects, you know, traditionally, um, we think of physical objects like, mm -hmm. you know, the table and the chair and the tree and so on, but actually, um, everything that is experienced is an object sure a thought or a thought anything. An emotion any any perception any mm -hmm. sensation all of those things are really objects but who are all these things occurring to what is that and that is the subject okay. so th there is the soul subject and everything appears to that subject um, and they're all objects yes okay so we could say that the mechanics of perception are such that there's an observer, there's, mm -hmm. the, there's the observed, and then there's the process of observation, right? Yes, ab absolutely. The tri um, you know, the classic triad. Right. And yes. process would involve the mind, the nervous system, the senses, and all that. Um, so what is that observer? We, it's pretty easy to put your finger on the, the object or even the, you know, the, the, the mechanics of perception, yes. but how about the perceiver or the observer? Um, what is that? Yeah, so that basically sums up the spiritual path for me, which is 
what is that observer? Because ordinarily we think the observer is this person that it, that resides in this body. Yeah. You know, we did, most of us don't think the body as ourselves. You know, we think that whatever is inside the body that is, you know, being the puppeteer of the body is who we are, right? This the subtle body. So we take that to be the the subject. But then what the spiritual path shows us is that that too is an object. Right. And so the subject then is is aware pure awareness, which is which is not localized to the body and the mind. It is more global where even this person occurs in that awareness, in that global awareness. So that process from the subject, you know, with the small s, moving on to the the subject with the, with the capital S, uh, would be the journey, basically. Okay, good. I think most people listening to this will be familiar with that kind of notion. Um, and so, just to put a lid on it, the the subject which we hope to discover through spiritual path is not going to be discovered in the way that we discover Antarctica or, <laughs> or you know, yes. something under a microscope or, or it's, it's not something that can be observed through the senses any more than as the classic example, any more than the eyeball can sort of perceive itself. It's that which perceives. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think we'll get in more into that as we go into the, the path of the goddess, but that kind of knowledge is is actually one of the subtle veils that are very, very difficult to pierce through. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get into the path of the goddess. Um, you talk about um, how the feminine power became sidelined. I think that would be interesting to start with. Um, historically, what, what happened? Well, um, y you know, a lot of the r reports, for instance, of yoga, if you look at you know the origin of yoga, there are many different theories and many different uh, um, kind of uh, historical perspectives on on how yoga began. But one perspective is that um, because women have the cyclical nature, you know, they have these cycles of uh, menstruation and birth and menopause and so on. It is much more easy for women to actually observe their own physiological processes, which is what happens to the, not just the, you know, the reproductive system, but how it affects everything else because of these cyclical natures and um, the nature of the woman. And um, so one uh, theory in terms of the origin of yoga states that actually it was something that was discovered by women in the you know in the pre-vedic times and um and so they began to actually observe their physiology and to see could could we control this you know could we influence this by breath practices or through certain postures or or um by changing the way that we think or feel and and began to actually experience changes in their cycles as a result of changing these kind of, you know, the prana in the body and so on. So, um, and then they taught it to the men because, <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, um, you know, ultimately it's about progeny and the quality of the progeny. So if we can teach it to the men and have them also purify this prana and, and have the highest quality uh, progeny as a result of that and um, so they taught it to the men and eventually in in the Vedic times or oh, and and the, moving forward after that somehow women were just excluded from from all of that mm. and uh, the, so the very processes that actually helped create that you know menstruation and and so on especially in the in the Hindu tradition became a, a taboo that because women are, are going through these cyclical processes, they are impure or they should not be taught this. And while there is some wisdom in, in women not doing certain practices because it affects their physiology, it was just taken as, you know, being impure or inferior and um, passed on through centuries of that kind of wrong kind of thinking, which is still widely prevalent right now. Yeah. If you give credence to the notion of the yugas or any other model of 
ages and cycles with throughout history. Um, do you kind of see the, the patriarchal dominance as being characteristic or symptomatic of the, the, the so-called Kali Yuga or the Dark Age in which we seem to have found ourselves? And do you see this um, Me Too movement and the whole awakening of, of f the feminine and um, you know, divine feminine and emphasis in, in women's role in spirituality and so on to be a, a kind of a harbinger of, of better times? I certainly hope so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it's very interesting, you know, this whole issue of the Kali Yuga. And um, it, it's like, it seems like that that seems to be true, not just in our political and cultural and social kinds of upheaval that the whole world seems to be going uh, through right now, but also natural disasters and everything, for instance, that California is going through or other places are going through. It's like a, an absolute upheaval that change is the only way that whatever is the dominant structure whatever is kind of um, crystallized into being the norm is is not going to work anymore and and so too with the you know the me too movement and the um, redefining of those roles you know the gender roles and mm -hmm. saying well it's time to question those um, you know crystallized ways of thinking and conditioning that somehow we as um, the world have, you know, we have just kind of accepted to be the norm. Yeah, you and I were talking about Ama before we started here, and um, <clears throat> you know, she's doing things. She's been doing things all along in India. I mean, the very fact of what she does was totally shocking to a lot of sort of um, <laughs> male-dominated thinkers um, in India, touching people and hugging people and so on. But then she's also tried to. Um, put women in roles that are ordinarily reserved for men, you know, in, in India, yes. the various temple functions and, and yagyas and things like that, which women weren't supposed to be able to do. Yeah, absolutely. And so she is an absolute, you know, she's uh, a trailblazer, mm -hmm. you know, on and this whole um, in this whole spiritual movement. And uh, and so what really attracts me to this this path of the divine feminine is that even though, um, you know, it, the traditional spiritual paths have been patriarchal, there have been some traditions where it has um, not been the case, mm -hmm. where the women are still given their equal uh, place in, in, the, in the path, on the path, and are, um, are the actual keepers of that tradition. So you won't even find these teachers. You won't even find these women. They are not, you know, they are not going to be announcing themselves to be teachers. So it, it's really a stroke of luck if you can find someone like that <laughs> to work with. Yeah. And but but there is that unbroken tradition still. Yeah. Well, here at Batgap, we have a policy these days, at least last year or two uh, of in interviewing an equal number of men and women um you know it's like irene says okay we're looking at march so here's two men now we need two women um and so we, we really <laughs> we really try to stick to that oh thank you thank you for doing that <laughs> yeah <clears throat> um okay so shakti and the mahavidyas so the mahavidyas as i understand it um well you go ahead and define them Sure. So, uh, Maha means great and Vidya means knowledge or wisdom. So, um, these are the goddesses of great wisdom, uh, uh, great goddesses of cosmic wisdom, um, many different ways of defining them, but that's really the essence of the, uh, the definition of the word Mahavidya. And there are traditionally 10 Mahavidyas or 10 goddesses of great wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, the most famous of them is Kali. Um, and what makes them great? You know, what, what is it that makes the sequence of this group of goddesses so unique is the first aspect is that they each of these goddesses represents a force of creation, like Kali represents time, and Bhuvaneshwari represents space, and so on. So there is one thing, that is one thing they all have in common. The other thing they all have in common is that they are all fierce. 
so you don't see any of the you know uh, the demureness in them <laughs> and uh, you don't see the uh, patriarchal definition of femininity in them because um, they defy all such norms of what the feminine is supposed to be and um, and they defy those norms because Shakti is everything. You know, she is all of creation. So um, we fact, it, call many it, of the images of their fierceness um, depict them taking it out on men. <laughs> you know, standing <laughs> on them, lopping their heads off, cutting, you know, smashing their, pulling their tongues out, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's it. Well, you know, they they are typically representing um you know the man the poor man in all of these is is, is, is in all of these um imageries is, is shiva but um there is of course as you know there is a um a very deep symbolism behind that um but you know it's not like a it's it's not like these goddesses are um you know they are not propagating um this kind of a um, you know what I call the um, misinformed feminism. That's not what these goddesses are about. Uh, but they, whether we are, whether I'm a man or a woman, um, the Mahavidyas are are going to be extremely important because the the third thing they all have in common is they all represent aspects of our own psyche and our own. Uh, you know the kinds of things that keep us bound to this, to thinking that the self is this body mind, um, which is what I call the shadow aspect. And then they also have the opposing quality of the light, which leads us to liberation from that. So they and and so they are not. You know how um, deities always represent the highest. In, in any particular tra tradition. And they are pure goodness or pure light. So the Mahavidyas are not like that because they represent, they, they don't exclude the darkness. So they, they include all of the uh, darkness and all of the, uh, you know, the so-called negative aspects to show that Shakti does not prefer one thing over the other. She is everything. Well, if we look at the actual universe, it's a pretty wild place. I mean, yeah. you know, there are, <laughs> you know, planets getting smashed by asteroids and getting melted by, you know, expanding suns and, you know, all yeah. kinds of, uh, it's a, you know, violent place and full of beauty, full of violence um, and death and life. And I mean, the whole spectrum of, of possibilities is on full display. Um, yeah. So if these goddesses represent the impulses of intelligence, governing the universe then it's completely in keeping with the iconography that they you know have these fierce aspects i would say as well as compassionate aspects i mean their whole point is not to just wreak havoc but to destroy ignorance and to liberate people and so on yes absolutely and and so you know this is this is uh why it they really force us to kind of smash our own stereotypes of mm -hmm. what we think we are um because you know for instance we talk about ahimsa you know nonviolence as the fundamental um uh, you know the fundamental ethic of yoga for instance right. or of any spiritual path but then you know you look at kali or any of these goddesses you know their their imagery is one is is very violent right and so especially kali for instance and and if you look at kali you wouldn't be thinking well, she's representing nonviolence. You know, that's not what comes to mind. It's extremely gory and violent. But, but as time, you know, as the force of time, um, it's the perfect, you know, representation, if you ask me. Because time is violent. It's ruthless. It doesn't wait for anybody. It doesn't care about, you know, our precious, uh, you know, memories and so on. It's, it's just... It doesn't wait for anybody. It doesn't care about anybody. It's always going, right? right. And so she is um, showing that. And and you know when we think about life itself, um, ask a woman who's given birth if that was a nonviolent process. Right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so everything you know by by taking birth, you know, just taking birth itself is a violent process. So you know if we don't accept that, then we are living in delusion. 
that there is going to be a place of absolute nonviolence all the time. There is never going to be such a thing. So how do you reconcile the prescription of Ahimsa in, in Patanjali's yoga with the reality of the universe and with the depiction of these Mahavidyas? So I think that's, uh, you know, that's, that can be a path in itself over a lifetime. You know, this, this real discovery of Ahimsa within ourselves and the actual practice of it. Because we, some, so we think that, you know, nonviolence is about not killing and not, you know, doing these kinds of bad things to other people, which is, of course, part of that. But it's much more subtle than that, you know, especially as uh, spiritual practitioners and, and spiritual seekers. We are we can be extremely violent in the way we judge other people who are perhaps not on the path and uh, how we judge ourselves and how we judge everything and think that this is not how it should be. So any resistance to um, what is, is violence. Mm. And, and, and just to come to that acceptance, I think, is, is the path of Kali. It's true. I mean, Kali herself is not resisting what is. Um, one thing that comes to my mind is James Bond. He had a license to kill, right? Uh, <laughs> but that, not, but ordinarily people don't have that license. And so perhaps we could say that a spiritual seeker, uh, it behooves or is incumbent upon a spiritual seeker to practice ahimsa, to be nonviolent. But if you happen to have risen to the, the level of, you know, one of the fundamental impulses of intelligence governing the universe, then, then some sort of violence is within your job description. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we have to be violent sometimes in, in very subtle ways within ourselves, right? If you have these recurring, you know, self-defeating thoughts, for instance, um, then we can invoke Kali to behead all cut of them. Cut them off, yeah. You know? Yeah, so cut them off right at the source. But, but see how violence is required sometimes. And, you know, if you're a parent, you'll, you'll understand that sometimes... You know, you you need to be able to communicate with your children in a way that seems violent, but actually it isn't. Right. Right. In the in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, seems violent to the child. Like, stop scrubbing behind my ear. You know, or <laughs> <laughs> or you're depriving me of this candy. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, let know. me be on my phone 24 hours a day. Yeah. That, I'm sure you're you know, not advocating you... any kind of actual violence against children, but you know, <laughs> things from the child's no. perspective that seem so mean and unfair. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and I say that, you know, as a mother of two teenagers yeah. and, you know, and trying to direct them always into things that are, you know, more wholesome is as in don't be on your for a phone 12 hours a day because it's rots that's your brain. really not. Yeah, it rots your brain. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting, actually, because this points to a deeper point. Marat. Maybe you've already kind of said it, but if we if we regard the universe as being a one giant evolution machine, as having an evolutionary agenda or tra trajectory, then, you know, all the stuff that happens, however violent it may seem, is ultimately in our best interest. Uh, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's true that the universe has this evolutionary tendency or, or direction, which it seems to have if you look at its violent birth as the Big Bang and then its evolution over 13.7 billion years to where we've gotten it. It all involves, you know, exploding stars and, you know, all kinds of wild things happening in order to make life possible. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, even, you know, we were talking about the yugas earlier. Mm -hmm. And and if you look at, you know, every yuga has had, you know, its share of violence and its share of, um, you know, the bad guys, so to speak. So it, it seems like somehow, well, we are in this current era of um, really bad things happening, but but at no point in creation has there been a time when that has not been the case, mm -hmm. you know, because that is really part of the whole. And, um, you know, Kali Sadhana or the Sadhana of this particular Mahavidya actually shows us that, you know, that we need to get beyond ourselves in the way we think and because creation itself moves as a whole. It yeah. isn't, um, you know, restricted or there isn't, Kali doesn't prefer one thing over another. Mm. Everything is part of it. Yeah. 
and the balance keeps shifting between Sattva Rajas and Tamas yeah. and whatever other triads exactly. you want to define. That you know, there's a there's a cyclical nature to everything. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Turn, turn, turn. Um, okay. Now, here's a question: If uh, my we talk, we've alluded to the, the notion of the, the universe being intelligent and everything, nothing being arbitrary or, or accidental or capricious. There's this sort of infinite intelligence in every iota of creation and every vast phenomenon as well, galaxies mm -hmm. and their interactions and so on. Um, so when I think of these goddesses, I, I you know, I. I'm, uh, I wonder whether it would be actually possible to get down to some level where you would actually see one of them as depicted in these in these sorts of photos, um, you know, this kind of thing. Oops, there it is. Or whether those are just sort of artistic representations of, you know, um, streams of intelligence or impulses of intelligence which perform various functions. But when I say that, I don't mean to depersonalize them because I think that any, by definition, an impulse of intelligence, gross or subtle, is a conscious being. We are mm -hmm. an impulse of intelligence. There are angels and celestial beings who are impulses of intelligence and who are conscious beings in their own right. And I suspect that these Mahavidyas, if they really exist, are conscious beings who have a universal frame of reference or universal territory of influence. You know, they, they are, you know, kind of on the upper echelons of the hierarchy of creation and, and have a, a, a function that, that encompasses the entire universe or universes, as the case may be. What do you think about that? Yeah, and uh, that's exactly how I feel, is mm. that, there, that um, so, you know, to back up a little bit, so to to say that, for instance, um, to really define, you know, these Mahavidyas, you know, what are they? So um, and so we we have to just talk a little bit about um, this this dichotomy uh, between Shiva and Shakti, mm -hmm. and because and then we can understand that, which is, you know, in the tantric tradition, um, there is this potential before anything. So it, it, all of creation rests as a potential, latent potential and yeah. latent potential undifferentiated. And the first movement within that potential is self-recognition mm -hmm. or it is self-awareness. And so it is said that Shakti is uh, and Shiva separate in that self-recognition. So she is his self-recognition. So it's like uh, that that undifferentiated potential looking in the mirror and finding that the one here is Shiva and there is Shakti, mm -hmm. but they are actually one and the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with that differentiation, um, you know, there is the the whole creation process begins after that. And, you know, that that is the moment of the Big Bang, so to speak, that uh, self-awareness. And um, but but in order to understand that beyond that, then, you know, what creates space and time and this expansion of the universe and, um, you know, this, this creation of separate beings and so on. So Shakti is Shiva's creative power. So it is said that, you know, Shiva is pure awareness and pure awareness is attributelessness. And so there are no attributes. Shiva cannot create because his creative power is Shakti. And so um, that create, creative power, so if we have to create something, we need several different skills, right? And so those skills of creation are these Mahavidyas. So as time and as space and as the intention or will and knowledge and action and so on. So, um, so Shakti taking different forms are these Mahavidyas. So she is actually, there's only one, but she takes all these different forms mm -hmm. um, to go ahead with the process of creation. Yeah. Um, but they're all powers of Shiva. So, you know, they're always one and the same. So, you know, so they are universal in that, 
And but also they form each of these Mahavidyas forms a focal point of our sadhana and our devotion and our practice. And so anytime a deity becomes the focal point of a practice, we see them as such, you know, in our mind's eyes. I mentioned earlier that I thought that if you, um, if, a, if a qualified quantum physicist were to read this book, he would be able to correlate a lot of the things in it with the understanding that physics has come up with, which, because physics by definition is trying to um, understand the subtlest mechanics of creation from whence the whole creation arises and how it how it diversifies and differentiates and manifests and so on but um, there, there is one guy uh, there are a number of them Menas Kafatos and um, and others who who speak at the science and non-duality conference um, I've interviewed Menas another is John Hagelin whom I've interviewed um, who wrote a paper called is consciousness the unified field and, and goes into a real interesting explanation of uh, the sort of, I think he calls it sequential spontaneous symmetry breaking that happens as oneness diversifies into multiplicity. So anyway, that's not just a reference for people who want to look into that side of it more. Um, okay, so um, before we proceed, is there anything that, you, that has kind of come to your mind that you'd like to say? Mm, no. <laughs> okay, good. So let's let's start going through some of these Mahavidyas um, mm -hmm. and explaining the role and significance of each one. And um, the first in your book, and the first one you've primarily mentioned so far, is Kali, who represents time, um, and uh, which is also related to death, where letting go and moving on brings new life. Um, so. What shall we say about her? <laughs> Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say, she'll get you. <laughs> um, you know, we could we could talk about Kali for hours because um, you know there's so much to say about her because mm -hmm. uh, she is you know in this uh, in in the among the Mahavidya she represents time and so she is the primordial force and that's why she's also called Adi Shakti. The first primordial, shakti. Yeah. the first shakti, because, um, and 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 you know, so in in regards to Kali, I think, I think there are so many different aspects of Kali. You know, she is the also the goddess of transformation because time is transformation, and um, and and so, one thing that uh, I think it's really important for me to say and uh, and and to and to just put it out there is that there is a lot of um, kind of correlation of Kali these days with what I what I was saying earlier about misinformed feminism as if uh, like she is the goddess of vengeance or that you know somehow uh, we tend to justify our rage by portraying Kali. Mm and and um or durga or any of these goddesses as if saying that uh, look it's a, you know i can embody that right. but uh, but i what i want to say is no we can't embody that because she is adi shakti and um it's going to take a lot more than rage to to embody her and um and and that requires transcendence of time mm -hmm. and um and the limitations of linear time, which is really her biggest, um, you know, trap, or in the way she entraps us in this illusion of, of uh, being this limited time, uh, you know, time-bound kind of person, uh, with our stories and so on. So, um, you know, I think there is, there is a lot of misunderstanding around Kali. Yeah, I mean. If, as the story goes, her rage was um, a benign thing that uh, she came into being to get rid of some real bad guys who were, who were making a lot of trouble in the universe. And, yeah. um, and ordinary human rage isn't necessarily so benign and constructive. Um, it's, it can be damaging and violent and, and harmful. Um, so. Uh, like as you say, we sh we shouldn't necessarily use Kali as an alibi for uh, venting our anger. 
Yeah, and so, you know, you bring up a really good point, and that story that you were relating from is from the Devi Mahatmyam, you know, where, where Kali actually lead, leaps onto this battlefield, uh, you know, from Durga's face, mm -hmm. and um, it is exactly to uh, vanquish these asuras or these, you know, bad forces of the universe. But however, the Devi actually in, in the Devi Mahatmyam says, there is nobody to kill because they're all me. And, and so her rage and her destruction, they're all a show because, the, you know, the good and the bad, there is, she's, she declares that they're also my children. They're also me. And so, you know, that, that non-differentiation between me and other is, is the fundamental principle, right? And, and if we, we can't embody Kali's rage unless you know, that is also our state of being, that non-separation. Yeah. And the Gita says stuff like that, too. You know, weapons cannot cleave him, fire cannot burn him, water cannot win yes. him, wind cannot dry him away, and, and so on. That The sort of indestructibility of the, of the self, which is obviously not true of the body. So yeah. we have to know ourself as being that which is uncleavable and so on, or else we're just sort of misapplying levels. Yes, exactly. And, you know, in the 11th chapter of the Gita, when, when uh, Lord Krishna shows his universal form, mm -hmm. the Vishwarupa to Arjuna, he's, Arjuna is actually shocked to see that, you know, even the Kauravas are part of Krishna. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is who, who all the, the bad, bad forces. guys in that story, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Everybody is, is swirling around in Krishna's form. Like, you know, he's everywhere. He is encompassing everything. Yeah. Well, if we think of Krishna as God, and if we define God as the sort of universal intelligence, which even scientifically we can see is functional in every single particle of creation, we can't, we can't find a place where we don't see all those laws of nature functioning in one way or another, then obviously it has to be a totality which contains all the parts. There, there could be nothing outside of it. Exactly. And so it is also, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, we call it, we call that intelligence Krishna. Mm -hmm. And in the Devi traditions, we call that intelligence Devi or Shakti. Yeah. <laughs> I was just com commenting with someone the other day about one of the meanings for Krishna is black. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that the color black is, it, it's, it's some, anything that's black absorbs all colors of the spectrum. It doesn't reflect any. Um, yes. And that some also reminds me of that saying that Brahman is the eater of everything. So that somehow yes. the, the totality absorbs or eats or consumes or subsumes uh, all the diversity. And and so it is with Kali. You yeah. know, she she is absolutely black. Mm -hmm. You know, there is there is. So that's how you differentiate her from Tara, for instance, who has a little bit of color. But ah. Kali is absolutely black. Mm -hmm. She is the black goddess for the exact same reason, which is and and I I don't know if you knew this, but Kali is supposed to be Krishna's Shakti. Oh, I didn't know that. I did not yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So she is, um, you know, considered his uh, Shakti. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Huh. Now, um, you know, a lot of these goddesses, Kali included, are always wearing garlands of skulls. And yeah. the, that, that's a, as I understand, that's supposed to be symbolic of the destruction of egos um, in, yes. a good, in a good sense. Um, kind of like... Um, which it would be destruction of ignorance in, yes. in a person. Um, and so, you know, in, in your book, you refer a lot to the I self. And so I have some questions about the I self. <laughs> um, sure. Does, does everyone have one? Um, can we function without one? Um, you, you, here's a quote from your book. The sense of separation is reinforced through comparison and judgment and the I self grows stronger. Um, can one be utterly without an I self and still function as a human being, or does there need to be, or, or does the I self get transformed into something more pure, but there's still some sort of recognition of, of a person here in order to w live in the world? Yeah, so that, that is a great question. So the first question, does everybody have one? Yes, unless uh, we have, you know, worked through it and, um, and so on. But Yes, everybody has one because we are, you know, we are culturally and socially universally um, conditioned to develop one. And that happens at a very early age when, with the, with the uh, formation of, with giving a child a name and suddenly there is a separation between 
uh, me and the mother and me and me and everybody else. And that sense of me is what I'm calling the I self, which is you know, uh, the story of the me uh, that that, uh, you know, revolves around the body and the mind and e called the ego in every um, tradition. And the ego, I, I specifically didn't want to use the word ego because sometimes it, it's, it means uh, an inflated sense of self, but I didn't, I did, I specifically left that out because you may not have an inflated se sense of self, but you have a sense of self. Right. Uh, that is limited. And so that's why I use, the, you know, the I self as the word. And um, so is it possible to live without uh, an I self? Well, you know, there are, uh, you know, accounts of people that uh, live or have lived through the, uh, you know, that whole um, no self kind of an experience. Um, now I forget. Uh, who who is I, I'm sure oh, you are Ananda, the experience Ananda of Myma or somebody or who, who are you? no uh, the Christian mystic um, oh Bernadette Roberts yes Bernadette Roberts right. you know have you read her book the experience of no self I've got it on the shelf and, here I've dabbled yeah, in it but <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you know she describes this whole process of how she lives through or lived through that phase of the complete falling of away of the no self mm -hmm. now. Did she you know, pass through that phase and eventually discover uh, uh, some kind yeah. of self there? I think so. That's I think you know. Then she she dis, she talks about coming back to the marketplace after having been a nun for yeah. many many years, and um, and and the that sense of self coming back in a very different way. <laughs> yeah, different. Where it is where it is more of a functional thing. Right. Where it is it is for living day to day, but there isn't that self referential thing going on yeah. all the time. And, um, uh, you know, Gary Weber and others talk about, um, you know, these, uh, you know, the the two neural pathways. One is the one that is constantly self-referential, you know, this is the blah, blah right. network. And then the other is the task positive network, which in which there isn't the self-referential thing going on all the time. And so if we lose that, the task positive network is still there. And, you know, these sages call that the, the, you know, the state where the mind is your slave rather than you're the slave of the mind. Yeah. Um, where the mind is used for functional, you know, for doing practical things, but then it doesn't exist otherwise. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, so, but there is still is one. So, you yeah. know. Um, so if you say, hey, Nisargadatta, would you like a cigarette or something? He, he knows who you're talking to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially with the cigarette. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. and, you know, and then obvious examples would be like somebody has, says they have no eye self, but then you stick a fork in their leg or something. They, they know that that's happening. There's some kind of localized identification with that experience. It's not the same as sticking a fork in, in the table or something yes. like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I think I think this is where um, there are subtle differences between, uh, you know, the tantric path and the other paths. I think this is it's, it's one of those subtle things where, you know, for instance, in my uh, studies of Advaita Vedanta, the the teaching or the general consensus was you need to lose the ego. And and so you know that losing the ego is is the beginning of enlightenment or uh, the beginning of awakening, but uh, but that isn't really the issue in tantra. You know, it is actually refinement where you know that you're not that, but then what that sense of self is is continuously refined, where the understanding or the self knowledge actually pours through into the uh, into the body mind where our functioning becomes more and more and more refined mm -hmm. so it is actually a two way journey you know where you're going up and losing the sense of self of course that self referential kind of a thing but then the body mind obviously doesn't go away you're still alive and you're still functioning you're still living so that light of you know the self can be allowed to actually refine those conditioned pathways where, you know, what that means is it's very easy to be awake and still be a jerk. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Which brings and, into the question the, the whole issue of what it really means to be awake or what, what an awakening really means. I mean, you know, so many people say I've had an awakening, but I always think, yeah, fine, but there's so many possibilities for levels of awakening, degrees of awakening. And, you know, one awakening does not a saint make. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and so, you know, Tantra is very beautiful in that. It's, it's not like, don't limit you to transcendence. It's actually imminence also, which right. is the, um, the refinement of this body mind to, to levels of functioning where the we are actually rewiring our neurohormonal pathways and you yeah. know rewiring the whole um, physiology basically where we can live that light more and more yeah and as a physician i'm sure you know that the whole physiology doesn't get rewired overnight it's some it's yeah. neuroplasticity and all that takes yeah. it, it can be a lifelong process yes absolutely and, and that's what my other book is about by the way oh good i'll have to read that um, <laughs> Just one little comment I, I want. I, I made up this metaphor the other day. It's a variation on an old metaphor, but I was having a discussion with a friend about this no self thing. And um, it's like streams and rivers are completely distinct from one another. You know, this stream says, I am this stream and I'm totally different than that stream. But once they reach the ocean, then they all kind of merge and, they, and then they might say, oh, I'm just the ocean. And, and, but let's say for the sake of the metaphor that the streams don't completely cease to exist. They become currents within the ocean. Um, yes. You know, and so our individuality doesn't completely get obliterated, but it becomes sort of a component within a, a much greater wholeness. And um, and it, initially, the ocean might say, "I'm just the ocean. I don't see any currents," you know. And uh, conversely, the the current might say, "All I see is the ocean. I don't. I, I've lost any sort of sense of individuality." But I think eventually, if you kind of delve into and become sensitive to the fine fabrics of what's going on within consciousness, you discover all these currents and impulses of intelligence and dynamic things taking place within the oneness, within the wholeness. What do you think of that metaphor? Yeah, I love it. I love it. And and that's that's uh, that's absolutely beautiful. And that's uh, really, you know, the uh, the um, the crux of this path is is that there is the oneness, but there is also the uniqueness in which that oneness expresses itself. Yeah, in which and through which. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, getting back to my notes here. Um, this is still in the Kali chapter of your book. Um, As Kundalini touches each chakra, hidden issues surface so that they can be resolved. Um, I thought that was just interesting. That, you know, worth, no, worth discussing a bit. Um, so I can mm -hmm. elaborate on the question, but I think you know what I'm talking about. So go ahead, go for it. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we think of Kundalini, and I think this is where we really must um, define what Kundalini is, because we somehow think of Kundalini as, you know, this some kind of a huge energetic experience, and then you're all blissed out thereafter and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not really it. You know, the, the Kundalini is said to be active. In, on, in the tantric traditions, when you develop a, you know, what in Advaita Vedanta is known as mumukshutvam, you know, the burning desire for awakening, mm. where it becomes the primordial focus of your life, you know, that's when the kundalini is said to be active. You may not have all these energetic experiences. You may not like, you know, have all this buzzing and the vibration and stuff. And of course, a lot of people have that, but that isn't really it. And I think so when the, the roughness and smoothness of it depends to a certain extent upon how impeded it is, you know, if there's a yes. lot of blockages, then there can be a lot of intensity as those blockages are cleared and other people yeah. hardly notice anything going on at all. Absolutely. And yeah. so it all has to do with the nadis because, right. uh, you know, where the obstructions may be in the subtle body. And so the chakras are really the, con you know, the confluence of these nadis at specific points and the hundreds of them throughout right. the, you know, throughout the subtle body. But we are usually think of the chakras along the spine. And so this, the activated kundalini energy, which directs our desire for awakening, you know, goes up the spine, so to speak. And 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 so traditionally in the tantric uh, traditions and even the yoga traditions, we talk about these chakras as hosting or um, having certain uh, properties where certain issues are stored, you know, in the psyche. And um, 
so when when that energy touches that then all of those issues come really you know surfacing into our awareness and so for instance you know if you have a long term meditation practice it becomes really easy to see this is where the kinds of thoughts and the kinds of things that happen during meditation actually changes from day to day and the focus of it actually changes over time you know whereas sometimes it's uh, while it may have been about oh my gosh i'm not going to get this technique right i don't even know what it's supposed to be doing and and so on why am i even doing this and i'm fine i you know i don't need to do this i have other things to do so it's all like you know in the in the in the lower chakra so to speak but then as we keep meditating and that inner silence becomes our you know seeped in then the issues become more and more and more subtle it's like you know we're asking the more um like the more existential questions it's like you know if i'm not this what is what is you know my property what am i who am i and so on mm-hmm. so that means that the energy is going up so as the energy actually touches each of these chakras then we are forced to confront you know these issues and so you know um and this is probably is something you have noticed over your years of teaching meditation is um somehow when we come to this path we think everything is going to be solved you know all our problems are going to be solved and uh it's all going to be one smooth thing and then we discover that my gosh you know this isn't what i thought it was going to be then that we go through intense periods of purification and intense periods of upheaval yeah, and that that's not part of the initial sales pitch yeah <laughs> <laughs> but but you know that's that's really what happens and that, that those periods of upheaval are where the kundalini is touching those chakras opening them yeah. so those those issues can be resolved yeah yeah there was a phrase that i probably heard marishi repeat a thousand times and that was something good is happening you know yes. so when people are going through the these really intense things especially on long meditation courses six month courses and stuff he would always say over and over something good is happening just stay with it yeah. yes exactly yeah so that's that's that whole you know um i call it the washing machine effect yeah. when i my students right <laughs> so yeah um you know what a venn diagram is right Mm-hmm. Yeah, where you have like two circles and they overlap yeah. a little bit but not entirely. So yeah. if we take, you know, Vedanta and Tantra as two circles, mm-hmm. to what extent do they overlap and diverge uh, if you look think of them as a Venn diagram? They overlap to a large extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, a very large extent. Um but there are some fundamental differences between um uh, you know, Vedanta and Tantra. And uh for instance in vedanta uh, you know even even if you look at the bhagavad gita for instance um the, brahman doesn't do anything you know brahman is not the doer mm. brahman just is you know mm-hmm. and it's like saying awareness doesn't do anything which right. is really our experience as well uh which is there are no creative powers attributed to brahman mm. so so in vedanta you know we differentiate brahman from ishvara So Ishvara is the is the creator but Brahman is is pure untouched cannot do anything mm. whereas in in tantra there is no such differentiation so Shiva and Shakti together are endowed with the creative potency so they have these five functions of creating and sustaining and destroying and concealing and revealing so they are inherent qualities of you know the divine so so that is like one fundamental difference okay. between between the two and and there are other fundamental differences you know a lot of people think um that in advaita vedanta there is there remains the separation between the you know the maya which doesn't exist and the, all that exists is brahman and that is i think only part of the story because i think that is a misunderstanding of advaita vedanta because even shankara doesn't say that maya doesn't exist he says maya doesn't exist as we think it does you know the classic example is the rope and the snake right. um that it doesn't exist the way we think it does but 
we can get stuck between that and and seeing that Brahman is the only reality and Maya simply doesn't exist. And that is still a duality there. Yeah. Whereas uh, Tantra resolves that right from the beginning, where is, you know, uh, Maya, it's not it's not that it doesn't exist. Everything is real. Yeah, well, you remember what Shankar said. He said, you know, the world is Maya. Brahman alone is real. Brahman is Maya. Brahman is the world, you know? Yes, exactly. Um, but, but and Shankar, incidentally, wasn't he a Kali worshiper? Or was that, uh, that he, was Ramakrishna, right? but he was a, yeah. some aspect of Mother Divine. He was a devotee, right? Oh, yes. He was very much a mother devotee. And, you know, he was a worshiper of the Sri Yantra. And uh, a lot of people attribute him to have written the Saundarya Lahari, which is the, you know, the, um, the absolute magnificent, very lush text uh, describing the Tantric um, uh, worship and visualization of the goddess. Yeah. So uh, some people say that's not the same Shankara, but uh, some people think it's the same Shankara. Okay, um, but it's worth pass mentioning that in passing simply because, I mean, almost all these great non-dual teachers that we revere, both ancient and modern, were um, devotees of, of something or other, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, um, yes. You know, every single one, Papaji and Ramana and Nisargadatta and Sh Shankara going back then, um, there wasn't a complete dismissal of all vestiges of, of duality as unworthy of our attention. There was a, a sort of a, in fact, Shankara said that the intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion. So mm -hmm. e even if he acknowledges that duality exists, intellectually at least, it, it, he, he considers it to have a purpose. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, this is something I just discovered recently, which I didn't know. And, uh, you know, Sh uh, Shankar actually established all the Shankar Mats, mm -hmm. you know, in, in India. And uh, I've been to a couple of them, actually. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know this, that um, he actually, the, he established the tradition of daily worship of the Sri Yantra uh -huh. in, the, in the Mat, which is very secret, but it needs to go on four times a day all the times, mm. you know, all the time. And and there is that worship aspect of it in an Advaitic uh, center. So that it, says something. Is Sri Yantra part of Sri Vidya? And, it is. And the reason I ask is that, um, you know, Maharshi's teacher, Swami Brahmananda Saraswati, was a, a, a worshiper or a practitioner of Sri Vidya. And he ended mm -hmm. up becoming Shankaracharya of Jyotirmat for the first time yeah. in, in ages. They hadn't, hadn't had a, a Shankaracharya for a couple hundred years or something, and they got him to do it. But anyway, I found that interesting. I don't know much about Sri Vidya. Would it be nice to, uh, I mean, would it be interesting to tell people about that? Or should we save our time for talking more about your book and the Maha uh, Vidyas and all? Um, I think it's it's worth mentioning just in passing at okay. least, uh, mm -hmm. because the Mahavidyas are also part of the Sri Vidya tradition. Okay. And uh, that's how I was introduced to them um, in, in my Sri Vidya Upasaka, uh, Upasaka role. And um, so Sri Vidya is actually, Sri means auspicious, Vidya is knowledge. Right. So it is, um, Sri Vidya is auspicious knowledge. And it is the particular um, path to liberation where liberation is manifests as the goddess Tripura Sundari. And she is the third of the Mahavidyas in the book. And um, so she is the central goddess and she is the creator, she's the sustainer and she is the destroyer of everything. So um, it, is the, it is the path to her and the path involves mantra and, uh, you know, it's a tantric path. So it also involves yantra and uh, specific rituals and practices uh, that lead us to uh, goddess through Sundari. I just want to say again, as we said in the beginning, that all this talk of worshiping goddesses and all shouldn't be um, trivialized or dismissed as some quaint, you know, um, my mythical indulgence or something like that. We're, we're really talking about a deeper mechanics here, which um, can be extremely potent and powerful and transformational um, to those who engage in it properly. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, the thing about the yantras, I just want to say this because my tantra teachers, um, you know, particularly don't really recommend worshiping of yantras. They think it's 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 not necessary because the yantras begin to manifest in our own um, experience as our neural pathways change. 
So actually, these Meaning yantras you perceive are. Them or what? Yes, because these yantras are external manifestations of these, you know, the neural pathways hmm. within the brain. Uh, and that happens automatically. And there is no real need to worship external, uh, you know, yantras or do any external rituals. Mm -hmm. It's an entirely internal process where, you know, it changes our physiology. And with the change, these yantras actually start manifesting. Interesting. So Great. when we see these pictures of yantras, they may have come from the actual cognitions of the people who originally painted them or drew, drew them, that people saw this thing and then drew it out, right? Yes, absolutely. Huh. All of them. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Um, I was going to say something, but now I forget what it was. Oh, yeah, I know what it was. Um, you know, a lot of mantras um, have what are called a bija mantra in them, which, as I understand mm -hmm. it, is um, somehow a name of, mm -hmm. of a god or a goddess or some aspect of the Divine Mother and all. Um, and I've been using a mantra like that in one form or another for a long time but um i still don't know a lot about the esoteric uh, significance and mechanics of it is there anything you can say that would educate me on that and others yeah absolutely so the the bija mantra is actually um you know each of them actually maps to a particular cosmic force so mm -hmm. to speak and then and of course the cosmic force is given a form of a deity, right. and um, and and so we think that it maps to that particular deity. But actually, the the quality of the sound is such that you know it opens us because you know these bija mantras are derived from Sanskrit, and Sanskrit you know in certain traditions like the Sri Vidya Sadhana or Kashmir Shaivism, there is this whole concept of matrika shakti, where each uh, syllable in Sanskrit actually maps to a different. Uh, point in consciousness, different, you know, different uh, aspect of consciousness. So the bija mantras are those, they actually map to certain points of those conscious, of our consciousness and opens to us to the whole. So when, when you take combinations of these bija mantras in specific sequences, which is really what Sri Vidya does, um, then you open in certain ways to that consciousness, uh, you know, through different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. and, and then as a result of that, then the neural pathways change and the yantras start manifesting. Hmm. So when you say you open to different aspects, could, could, it, could you think of it as there are, many, there are a number of different bija mantras and um, do all roads lead to Rome? Could they be thought of as like spokes on a wheel which all lead to the hub? You take the one that mm -hmm. works for you or is appropriate for you or something like that and then you follow it back to its source and it has an influence that's conducive to doing that. Um, yes. th there's a whole discussion of the vibratory influence of, of these sounds as opposed to any meaning they may or may not have. But, you know, different sounds have different vibratory qualities. You scratch your fingernails down a blackboard that has one influence, a you know, beautiful flute melody has another. And so these sounds are said to be conducive to the settling of the mind and body down to transcendence. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that that is really the um, the cosmic force called Tara, who's the second Mah Mahavidya, oh, you know, so, 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 yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, she, so it's it's a perfect segue into into understanding mantras because she is the the power behind all mantras okay. uh, because she she represents the primordial vibration. And, you know, in, in physics, if we want to loosely map it, and I, I just want to emphasize the word loosely because may not really be so tight in terms of correlations. But, you know, the the um, the the background um, microwave, uh, what do you call that? The Radiation. back microwave. Yeah, the, the original radiation from, of the Big Bang, which they discovered at Bell Labs, right? Yes, exactly. So uh, that's something I think of as, you know, what Tara is, which is the, the, the primordial vibration, which is the mother of all other vibrations oh. that become forms. Yes, the Om or um, I am or, you know, uh, that is that primordial vibration. So all Bija mantras actually lead to that, uh, that primordial vibration. Right. So they're all modifications of that primordial vibration. So she is, um, you know, Tara is the mother of mantras mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the Mahavidya tradition. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard the notion that 
using a mantra with om in it tends to make you more of a recluse. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Do you, do you believe I that? I have heard that. I have heard that and I have experienced that. Have you? Um, yes, yes. And uh, it, it, it is really true and it's mm. very profound. And um, So do it you does... still use a mantra with om in it? No, oh. no. I was taught not to mm. uh, because I was using it uh, for a while and um, and it really makes you dissociate from stuff mm. and, uh, you know, kind of not. Yeah, but at different stages, I would say. Yeah, maybe you know, different you, stages, because I mean, for, I, w I had heard that and for decades used a mantra that didn't have OM in it. And then I got a mantra from Ama about 15, 18 years ago that did have OM in it. I've been yeah. using that ever since, and it hasn't tended to make me more of a recluse. So I wonder, was that total BS? Or, or, <laughs> 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 no, I think it, it just depends on the stage, uh, yeah. because I kind of did that early on. Or, you know, uh, what Yogani says is that it's more of an issue in the intermediate stages uh -huh. and uh, of, of meditation practice. Okay. And, it, you know, it, it, as a beginner, it won't affect you. As you're more advanced, it won't affect you. But in the intermediate stages, if you pick that on, to, you know, take that on too uh, early, um, then it may not be the right thing for you. I see. I think it also would depend on whether you're just using OM alone, OM, 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 or whether you're using it in conjunction with the Bija Mantra and other mm -hmm. aspects that mantras tend to have in them. Yeah, exactly. And and OM as a an external chanting thing is is not the problem. It's that, you know, using it to transcend the mind, right. that that is when it becomes an issue. Okay. Good. Um, while we're on this topic, and this is this is an interesting discussion. I mean, it's like not your plain vanilla bat gap interview. We're getting into all kinds of things that <laughs> I haven't really discussed much in other interviews. So I'm enjoying this. Um, in the Tara part of your book, you say, sound is the subtlest of the senses. This is the principle behind mantra sadhana. And um, if you think about that, um, you know, I've, I've heard it said that thoughts are a subtler aspect of the sense of hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't really get that so much with other senses, although you might, you know, visualize dinner or, or get some taste of dinner in your, in your mind's eye. Uh, but we're much more familiar with thoughts than we are with the subtler aspects of the other senses. And therefore, that would, it would make sense that um, using the sense of hearing, namely thought in the form of a mantra, would be perhaps a more um, well, uh, uh, an easier road to traverse than, than some of the other senses. Yes, absolutely. So you've heard of the word tanmatra. Yes. You know, tanmatra is, is that five the subtle elements, sense. Or, so, so yeah, the, the five element. elements. Yeah. Yeah, the subtle, you know, the subtle sense uh, relating to a particular element. I think Indriyas and, and comes in there someplace too, doesn't it? The Indriyas? Indriyas, yes, right. exactly. So the Indriyas are the external senses and okay. the Tanmatras are the, you know, the subtle sense, so I to see. speak, and, and mediated by a particular element. Mm -hmm. And so and so there are the five elements. Uh, and so earth, for instance, it it is it it carries the tanmatra of smell. Mm. So it is it is the the grossest of those tanmatras, mm -hmm. whereas uh, sound is carried through by ether or Akasha. space, mm -hmm. akasha, which is the the most subtle of I the see. five elements. Yeah. So that's why it's the most subtle, you know, of the uh, the the five uh, senses huh. because it is carried through by that akasha. Okay, good. That's interesting. Um, okay, so we've talked about anything more you want to say about Tara? Well, um, it, it, with each of these um, Mahavajvis, you mentioned a shadow and, an a, uh, and a light aspect of them, and yeah. her shadow is self-deception, her light is truth. Yes, yes. So self-deception, I think, is, is, um, is interesting because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we kind of deal with in one form or other, uh, whether we are on the spiritual path or not. You know, ordinarily, of course, as you know, we can understand that self-deception. But even as we progress along the spiritual path, you know, this self-deception can can be so subtle that we miss it entirely. Mm. And um, you know, it it comes through this. You know, most commonly um, through um, justification and validation of our actions and our thoughts and our feelings like on a constant basis and still that goes on with that self-referential you know kind of a loop where i do something and i feel really validated 
or validated internally or externally or justified in one way or another. And and so Tara actually cuts through that and it's it's very um, it's it's a very shocking thing when you do this Tara sadhana and you you know kind of she just like comes in and cuts through all of that mm -hmm. and um, you know it's like she stands for absolute radical truth which is always staying true to your own experience yeah. and without any of that any of that self deception um, so um, so that's how you know I kind of correlated that with the um, the yamas and niyamas, you know, of, of truth mm. being one of them. That's nice, always staying true to your own experience. I mean, I've been guilty of not doing that many times, and even in a metaphysical or philosophical sense, you know, just sort of pontificating about things which I haven't actually experienced, you know? And so, how, how yeah, do I Yeah, I think I really we all know? do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 we do that. And, and, um, I think now, especially in the day of the uh, in these days of uh, the internet and easy access to information, mm -hmm. it's probably a little more, you know, um, easy to do that yeah. and to to deceive ourselves into uh, thinking one way or the other in terms of where we are. Yeah, and it's interesting about self-deception too, because I mean, there's that phrase, the blinding darkness of ignorance. Um, it's and the, Jesus saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. It's, um, and then there's so, so many marvelous stories in the, in the you know, Vedic literature about Maya, you know, like, like who was it, Nar Narayani, or Nar Narayan asking his disciple to go off and get him a glass of water, and he goes yes. off and goes through this whole thing where he meets a pretty woman at the well and ends up marrying her and having kids and, yeah. and everything else, and then this big flood comes and he cries out to Narayana, and, and, and all of a sudden the flood disappears and Narayana is saying, well, where's my water, you know? So. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is, uh, that's exactly the story I was thinking of when we were talking about some of this stuff. Amazing. That's Sage Narada. Yeah. Who, um, Narada, you know, right. Narada. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, you know, there are stories actually of even uh, Vishnu being self-deluded, you know, or yeah. or his own stories of self-deception, uh, where uh, you know he he takes on uh, the form of Mohini for a particular uh, you know uh, function, and then looks at himself in the mirror and thinks, oh my gosh, I'm so beautiful, and um, Shiva needs to remind him, wait, you're not even a woman, forget Mohini, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, well, on this note, there's a fascinating thing in your book about how you say that, you say that, um, you know, if it weren't for self-deception, we wouldn't really have a universe. And it's necessary, sort of the creator, however you want to define the creator, um, hides himself from himself or herself from herself in order to have a creation. And it makes the whole thing more interesting than it would otherwise be. Um, yes. And I'm not sure which of the Mahav uh, Shaktis. Is uh, that's Chinnamasta. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. It's a bit of a jump from where we're skipping some, but... I've, I've often pondered that and didn't think of it in terms of a Mahavidya, um, that there has to be this hiding quality. Yes. Uh, in order, which I think is perhaps a quality of Tamas or perhaps a quality of Chandas, you know, Chandas means hiding, um, in order for there to be a creation. Yeah. And, and you know how earlier we were talking about the five functions of mm -hmm. the divine, which is uh, creating, sustaining, destroying, concealing, and revealing. Right. So uh, those are the five functions of the divine in the tantric traditions. And so Chinnamasta represents both the concealing and the revealing power of the divine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's the fiercest of the Mahavidyas, you know, more fierce than Kali because she's the off. one that cuts her own head off and, you know, uh, and, and her own head is feeding from the you know the the blood in her severed neck, so um, that that beheading that self beheading is is you know very clear to see how the divine basically cuts itself off from its creation, um, so that you know there is the sense of separation and the whole drama goes on. It's like um, you know this very common metaphor we use in the spiritual path, which is that of a play and actors in a play and uh, you know you've heard of these actors who actually live in character because you know that's when their acting is so beautiful yeah, and, and they say that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio stays in character in between takes you yeah. know, because he doesn't want to have to move in and out of it he just 
you know. <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, you know, who was the actor who played Lincoln? Uh, one of my favorites, Daniel Day-Lewis? Yes, yeah. yes, he's magnificent, mm -hmm. and you know, he, it's you know, apparently he does that too, where mm -hmm. he stays in character the entire time because he becomes the character, yeah. and that's what makes his acting so powerful. And so he forgets his identity, and he is the character, mm -hmm. and so it's it's that's exactly like the analogy that we could use for the divine, where is if it forgets its identity so that the play can be beautiful mm -hmm. and engaging, and so that is the concealing power of Chinamasta, and um, and then of course on the spiritual path, she is also the great revealer because you know when that Kundalini goes up, then it's like a second beheading, but the beheading of the I self the identity or the engagement or the tight identification with the I self. And so the, that's the second beheading where you remember that, oh, wait, I'm not Daniel Day-Lewis. I'm a, uh, I'm so-and-so yeah. <laughs> or I'm Lincoln. I'm, I'm Daniel Day-Lewis or, you know, I'm not this character. So, um, yeah, I, I just love Chinamasa. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful, um, you know, metaphor for this whole process. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it's like, it's humbling. I mean, nobody is above it, as we were just saying. Even Vishnu got deluded and, and, and so on. So if you think that you're incapable of being deluded or, or being overshadowed or kind of getting lost, um, you might have a lesson to learn that won't necessarily be enjoyable. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, this is why I love those, uh, you know, the Puranas so much, yeah. because really teach us, you know, they are very humbling because there are there are stories where Shiva himself gets deluded mm -hmm. and, um, you know, or, or Devi, for instance, you know, Kali goes on this rampage in one story where um, nobody can stop her. And, um, and absolutely nobody can stop her. So Shiva comes and lies down mm -hmm. under her. And that's the first time she wakes up she's like oh this is my beloved mm. and um, and you know wakes up and then there's another story where nobody can stop her again and she goes on this rampage and Shiva takes the form of a baby and um, so suddenly she loses that rage and becomes this compassionate mother mm. uh, to this child so um, it's 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 exactly as you say that you know none of us is above that yeah there's uh, several other stories come come to mind right now about Shankara getting deluded and then snapping out of it, but I don't want to take the time to tell them. But the, <laughs> <laughs> yes, with the uh, Chandala. Yeah, with the, uh, there was that yeah. one. And there was the one where he kind of occupied the body of a king who had died in order to have the yes. kind of experiences that only a king could have. And then he kind of got so caught up in the role that he forgot that he was Shankara and his dis yes. disciples went running there and started chanting one of his poems or something to remind him of who he was. And Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, here's something in the Chinamasta section of your book that jumped out at me. That's a little bit of a, an abrupt segue, but uh, related. That um, Dharma keeps us on the path of appropriate cultivation of sexual energy, virtue, and wisdom. If we confuse our attachments and aversions for our Dharma, our creative and procreative energies are used up, and we remain attached to the I self. So mm -hmm. I like that. I yeah. 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 So. Yeah. You know, um, one thing that that is is foreign to uh, a lot of people who um, who are not very familiar with these paths is this issue of finding your bliss. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's that find your bliss the is, is a cliche. Right. Yeah, it's a cliche. Uh, you know, people think find your bliss means do what you want, which is do not what Joseph Campbell meant when he said that. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but we kind of confuse our likes and dislikes for what we must be doing, yeah. you know, or what are the dharmas. And, and so we get so caught up in that, that, you know, this, the, the, this energy, the kundalini energy that we were talking about, which is this burning desire for waking up is active. That doesn't simply happen because the prana is getting diffused into all these you know, other channels, you know, of our likes and dislikes and this where our senses are constantly ro roaming around where that energy is used up. Yeah. And so and, and it so happens that this Kundalini energy is a primordial sexual energy as well. And um, and it, we can't cultivate that to, you know, go up in terms of the 
achieving that beheading, that second beheading on, that Chinnamasta is representing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the two attendants that stand by her are, you know, like the, the two others. So, you know, in the um, traditional yoga or tantric traditions, there are there is the Sushumna, the central nadi um, that goes along the spine, and then the Ida and Pingala, which are the two side channels where the energy goes, and they kind of loop around like the, uh, you know, the symbol of medicine. And so what happens is when we are not aligned with dharma and and we uh, are following the bliss in in our misinformed way of following the bliss which we think is associated with our likes and dislikes and chasing our senses then uh, the energy gets diffused and goes is is directed more through the Ida and Pingala mm. and rather than the Sushumna and and so the Ida and Pingala are opposites you know they are one is the hot channel, one is the cold channel. One is the sympathetic, corresponds to the sympathetic system, one to the parasympathetic. So like the our likes and dislikes, you know, they are the channels of duality. So uh, they continue to switch between, you know, joy and pain and, you know, all the dualities that we get affected by. And so our, that energy that that very powerful sexual energy which is you know part of this kundalini energy gets diffuse in that and um and so you know the ashrama system of the um, you know of the ancient times was developed actually for ap appropriate cultivation of this energy so that it could be directed more into the central channel so that we could you know um uh, be liberated in in our lifetime. So, um, and the in the ashrama system, the dharma is actually very easy to follow if we follow the ashrama system. And uh, that that means, you know, as a child, your your duty is to study. You know, as long as you're a student, your uh, primary dharma is to focus on whatever learning that is taking place. And and only then are you. Uh, capable of going into this uh, householder life and as a householder then you know the the energy is explored in appropriate ways and then um, you know with retirement then that energy has uh, if it has been explored and if it has been um, used appropriately then the the thinking is that it would have subsided by then and uh, could be used by then the energy has gone up to the higher chakras where um, the thinking has changed and our worries are more in the metaphysical realm and uh, and then the sannyasa where the energy goes up even further and then we are in that uh, mode of um, self-knowledge and self-realization. Mm -hmm. And what about um, those who become monks and, and don't go through these four stages? Um, how do they deal with it? Yeah, so, you know, in the ashrama system of the old, uh, very few people actually were even encouraged to become monks. Mm -hmm. And only if they had that, that samskara of being a monk where they had already you know, they had signs of already having worked that, that tendency, worked yeah. through all that stuff. Yeah. Because, um, you know, if, if being a monk is something that, uh, you know, we develop, as, you know, like Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, yeah. where he says in the first chapter, I don't want this war, I right. just want to be a monk. And Krishna says, no, nothing doing. That's <laughs> right. not your dharma, not your dharma. Right? right? Yeah, that's not your dharma. Because we, if we are trying to be a renunciate because we are trying to escape life, then that doesn't really work because then that energy is still there and it can't be faked. It, there is nowhere to, for it to go. And uh, you see that in a lot of institutions, you know, where, um, you know, celibacy is forced. And well, the it, Catholic it, Church, I mean, you yes. know, what a mess. Yeah. And so anything that's forced like that has to be expressed and it becomes expressed in, in a dharmic way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. <clears throat> The Gita says, you know, because one can perform at one's own dharma, the lesser in merit is better than the dharma of another, you know. Yes, swadharma. Better death than one's own dharma. The yes, swadharma is it. Yeah. Yes. And so along, the, along this line of dharma is, is the issue of our gunas. 
you know mm -hmm. so what is it what is my dharma as opposed to yours you know is 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 really determined by our combination of, gun, uh, of gunas and so in the bhagavad gita for instance um you know uh, krishna talks about these four categorizations of um society. of of society of uh, occupation yeah. or vocation which based is a on the subject because you're touching upon the caste system here which is you know Oh yeah, the yeah. caste system is a complete, uh, you know, mess. Yeah. complete distortion of really what it's supposed to be, right. because um, our gunas change, and so our vocations may change with that. So you can uh, as from our, being a street sweeper to a, a doctor, theoretically, I mean, uh, or you can be, you can still be a street sweeper, but right. you know your gunas have changed, where you are no longer performing that job for whatever the original intention was. Yeah. So, origin and as our gunas change, we actually change and become more, uh, you know, evolved as as we progress along the path. So, you know, I I'm really not, you know, most Hindus uh, will tell you that the caste system is a complete distortion. Yeah. And. Uh, and not at all really what it was supposed to be. I'm sure, like many things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like pretty much every religious tradition in the world, which is probably a far cry from what its founder had intended. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're skipping over some of these. So we've touched upon Tara. Uh, I think we've touched a little bit about Trip Tripura Sundari, Sundari and there's Bhuvaneshwari and Tripura Bhavari. Um, we won't have time to spend a lot of time on all of them, but um, and and then there's this whole um, section towards the end of your book where you talk about elements of the path of the Mahavidya's devotion, single pointedness, austerity, surrender, experience, language, bliss. So th that was like a 30 second overview of the stuff we haven't talked about in your book. But <laughs> um, and then there's a beautiful thing about opening further through ethics and virtues, yamas and niyamas, and self after self after self realization. So uh, we could go on another two hours talking about all that stuff, but um, everything I just rambled out, what catches your attention that you'd like us to discuss uh, in our remaining time? Uh, perhaps about the issue of ethics. Okay. And uh, I think that's, and I know you, you did this whole panel uh, at SAND last year. Well, it was my talk uh, yes. at SAND, my own talk. And, and next year, I think we're gonna have a panel, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very important uh, subject because I think there is a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of misunderstanding that somehow uh, be, becoming awakened will instill you with all the ethics yeah. and, and that it's, it's just going to happen magically, even if you spontaneously even if you haven't really cultivated that and uh, some of it happens spontaneously because you you know you when you come from a sense of wholeness but a lot of it doesn't and i think um and i, I you know i think that's a good uh a good thing to discuss yeah let's do um, okay i think it's important um and it was very much in the air last year at Sand. After I gave my talk, uh, a bunch of people, teach, other teachers came to me and said, you know, that we were touching on that in our talks. So let's all sit down and discuss this. You know, some, there needs to be some kind of higher standard in the spiritual community because there's just been too much misbehavior and people, people, are, are, people are sick of it. People say they're yeah. getting sick of it. Oh, but Irene says people are getting sick of me harping on it too. So, yeah. but, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk, because I'm always griping about teachers behaving badly. And, oh. uh, <laughs> Okay, then we don't anyway. have to talk. Yeah, to heck with them. We're still going to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I really love uh, Greg uh, Greg's book, After Awareness, because he touches a lot on that. Yeah, I read that um, chapter. He sent it to me in preparation for my talk, and we were chatting back and forth a little bit about it. Yeah. yeah, and um, and I think that's a very. Uh, I think it is as touchy as it may be. I think it is a a very important thing to to really talk about, especially also in the context of tantra, mm -hmm. because um, you know I think tantra is misunderstood, as you know, as as this path that is about licentiousness. Right. That you can everything goes. Yeah, you and, can drink, you can do whatever, carry yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, but but that is not the case actually. 
and uh, and I go into that in a little bit in detail in the last uh, Mahavidya, the, in the chapter on Kamalatmika, on, on who really is qualified to explore with uh, some of the forbidden um, you know, practices and who isn't and why not, you know, and, and so, um, and, and in the name of Tantra, well, for instance, there are five substances, uh, forbidden substances or practices that uh, people really quote about or talk about in Tantra, which is n consumption of alcohol or uh, meat and uh, fish and, you know, um, a parched grain and sexual practices. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you can see how, you know, if a text tells you that you can practice with that, then, you know, in our ordinary way of thinking, we're thinking, wait, wait, you know, where all the other paths are saying, don't do that. And this is telling you, do it. I'm just going to go all out and do that. But the texts actually, um, like the Mahanirvana Tantra, for instance, r goes into detail about who is a qualified seeker who can do that. And, and one who is already established in awareness and is working on what you might call the post enlightenment sadhana where you know you are working to um, remain stable in that awareness while exploring those uh, substances mm -hmm. and so but in the name of tantra we there is a lot of um, letting go of ethics you know um, where where teachers may be behaving inappropriately with students and teaching them that that is okay to using do that. Using it as an alibi. Yeah. Uh, using it as a as a uh, kind of a crutch to fulfill their own, you know, uh, uh, needs or their own, uh, you know, wherever that that place that they feel need to feel fulfilled from. So, um, I think that's in in particularly in the tantric paths this cultivation of the ethics is um, really really important and and developing that discrimination you know that which is the foundation of um, advaita vedanta you know the two wings of jnana are discrimination and non-attachment viveka and vairagya and both are necessary uh, in order to um, explore further with any of those substances but then very important for the teacher to you know to develop those ethics yeah some people say that you know awakening and um and ethical behavior or have nothing to do with one another. You can be an enlightened scoundrel, and you can't judge a person's level of consciousness by their external behavior. And and other people hold a model that, you know, higher levels of consciousness or enlightenment uh, really involves um, cultivation not only of sort of inner awareness of pure consciousness, but a complete um, house cleaning of all of one's human tendencies so that they become pure. And yeah. you, you know, one's vasanas, so that you know you really do become saintly. Um, yes. And you, you hear people saying, you know, saintliness has nothing to do with enlightenment, and and you shouldn't judge it by by outer behavior. So, I don't know, what's your perspective on that conundrum? Well, you know, I think there are two aspects to this. One is that you know, the anything that is forced externally, including ethics, becomes a problem. Sure. Right. And and so I think that's where a lot of the uh, rebellion comes from. It's like, don't tell me what to do. And um, because it's it's forced upon us. Yeah. But but, uh, you know, what I'm suggesting in this book and in my own sadhana is that the the cultivation of ethics, particularly the yamas and niyamas, when we look at them from a more non-dual aspect and, and, you know, look at them from a and subtler and subtler um, uh, perspectives, then those actually change. And so, you know, it's like moving from the shadow to the light, you know, moving from the from the those tendencies into those where we can live those um, ethics in without really talking about them, without really being enforced. And those just happen. But if we pay attention to those particular shadows and um, and you know, as I was saying earlier, that is actually the difference between Tantra and other paths, where refinement of the body-mind to be in accordance with our highest understanding is really part of the path. Yeah. I've come to the conclusion just from my own life experience over the fifth, past 50 years and from my bat gap experience over the past eight years, uh, that everybody is a work in progress. You yes. Know, I've, that's such a, it's such a comfortable conclusion to reach because 
if you look at this or that teacher and think, well, this guy really knows where it's at. You know, he's really got it all figured out. And then he does, he or she does something that seems wrong. Uh, you, you can get you into trouble. First of all, you can become disillusioned, or you might think, well, who am I, ignorant schmo, to judge this enlightened person, so therefore I must excuse and allow this kind of wrong behavior, that kind of thing. But if you, if you kind of have the attitude that everybody's a work in progress, you think, all right, well, this guy has some work to do in this particular area. He may have great gifts and you know, radiate wonderful shakti and so on and so forth, but that doesn't mean that on all counts there has been complete development to the, to the highest degree possible. Yeah, I love that. And that's 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 how I feel too, is that we're all works in progress. And and I think that touches upon this issue of the guru, you know, the role of the guru, because we get disillusioned when we are attached to the teacher rather than the teaching, yeah. you know. And um, so it is, the more we get you know, attached to the finger pointing to the moon, uh, then the more chances there are of being in, forming opinions one way or the other about that person. Whereas, um, you know, if our sights are always on the moon, then, you know, then we realize that everything else is really not that important. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what somebody does or what somebody doesn't do. And as long as we are you know, our sight is on the highest always. Yeah, uh, it's like if, if one goes to study chemistry, for instance, um, you know, in college, one's orientation isn't, oh, my chemistry teacher is so wonderful, you know. It's like, <laughs> I'm interested in chemistry and this guy knows about it and he's teaching me and I, I, I appreciate and, and respect him for doing that, but the focus is on the chemistry, you know. Yes. But in, in spirituality, Part, part of the complication is that surrender to the guru is, has often been, you know, a requirement or advocated as essential to really learning what the guru has to teach in a way that you wouldn't expect from a chemistry teacher, you know. Um, yeah. He wouldn't say, surrender to me and I will give you all my knowledge, <laughs> although you do yeah. have to cooperate and do the tests yeah. and pay attention <laughs> in the lectures. So that, that almost, in, in a way, uh, it sets up the possibility of difficulty if it's in the wrong hands, you know? I mean, in the right hands, I, I imagine it can be a beautiful thing. In the wrong hands, it can be abused. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, that actually my, uh, friend, my friend and I were talking about this just yesterday with this whole issue of the inner guru. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about that in the book. Um, and we are always taught in Vedanta, for instance, that your uh, your guru is going to always be a manifestation of where you are at any given stage. And um, and so your outer guru is always a reflection of really what your heart's desire is, right? And on the spiritual path. And, and the, and, and I guess for me, you know, the, I'm really not the kind uh, that that subscribes to this whole surrender to the guru at all costs kind of a thing. I, but but I understand the teaching surrender to the teaching, yeah. but that may not that may not necessarily be the teacher. And and so my gurus and my teachers have always been ones who have kept themselves out of it and have always pointed to the moon and said, focus on that, not me. Yeah. And um, so that's worked out well for me. It also depends on how we define surrender. Uh, if it's some kind of slavish, mindless, you know, willless kind of um, subservience, uh, yeah. where you put aside your own good judgment. I mean, there's that great quote from the Buddha. He, he says, you know, don't believe anything anybody says, and even if I say it, if it doesn't yeah. can, you know, can jibe with your own understanding and common yeah. sense and, and so on. So, so we, you know, we, we have to define surrender for making these kinds of comments. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, this is the thing, whether it is with Vedanta or with, uh, or with Tantra, you know, the, the fundamental thing that is emphasized is, you know, you have to have, cultivate your own discernment. sense, discernment. Right. And that is like the most important thing because yeah. that is your guiding light. And the, uh, the surrender should be to that. And, you know, even Shankara says in the Viveka Churamani, uh, what really devotion is, who the devotion should be to, and it should be to the highest, you know, which is the self with the capital S. Yeah. So that is the the highest kind of devotion. And 
you know, the, the guru is just a, or the teacher is just the external person driving you to that, but your sights are always on the self. Yeah. And so discernment um, and discrimination, you know, Viveka is, Viveka is the most is, yeah, important. Yeah, right. Yeah. Question yeah. discrimination. Um, yeah. Yeah, so maybe a concluding point on this one is that any teacher worth his salt is going to um, do everything he can to help you cultivate discernment and discrimination. He's, he's not yeah. going to violate your tendency to be discerning or discriminating and, you know, say, you know, do as I say, not as I do, or any kind of nonsense like that. He's going to help you, you know, question, he's going to allow questioning yes. and, and not set himself up as infallible or yeah. uh, beyond reproach or anything like that, but sort of be humble and open. And, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's like it's like I tell my children is, um, you know, and I and and this is something that as a mother of two uh, daughters and and uh, telling them, you know, you need to trust your own self first. And 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 I also teach them, for instance, you know, uh, you don't have any responsibility for making me happy or, you know, that's not your job. Making me happy is my job, for instance. <laughs> however, uh, however, that doesn't mean that we, we, that you can do whatever you want because yeah, you still need to live in harmony. Right. Right. You need to still learn to live in harmony. And so it is with awakening and living in the world. You know, if you're, if you're awakened on a mountaintop, who cares? You know, you can behave as you want. But if you're living in society, then we still need to be able to live in harmony. And, um, and I think that's where these uh, ethical um, issues come in. Yeah. When we were talking earlier about, um, you know, Dharma and, and the good versus, versus the pleasant and so on, I... I just wanted to throw in the story of Nachiketas, which I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with, where I, yeah. it seems to be the conclusion of that story was uh, he he was, refused all these things that were just merely pleasurable because he wanted the truth, um, which is not, not to say that we should all abstain from any form of pleasure, but it's a matter of priorities, it seems to me. Yes. Uh, and that yes. if we hold adherence to truth and dharma as our highest priority, then all everything else kind of falls into place and, you know, gets properly ordered yeah and and that that is really the uh, the whole essence of chinamasta you know it's saying you know stick to that first and then you know the uh, other things will fall into place yeah seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else should be added unto thee yes um a question came in from uh mark peters in santa clara mark is a regular viewer of the live interviews and almost always asks the question he, he said um, can you speak about the divine feminine's role in establishing a sustainable relationship with the planet? Are global warming, deforestation, rampant consumerism, etc., largely symptomatic of the disconnected hypermentation that characterizes the masculine? Yeah, so that's a great question, and, and thank you for bringing that up because um, I just want to um, w want to talk a little bit about that because it's very important. And when we when we make this dichotomous division between the masculine and the feminine, we somehow remember that that too that division too is in our minds because the divine has no gender. The divine isn't dichotomous, and Shiva and Shakti are always one. And when if we talk about Shiva as a masculine force, and we say Shiva is attributeless, and everything in creation is Shakti, so the the issue of you know the the negative aspects the you know the destructive aspects are also shakti but that's her shadow side and so the role of the divine feminine is the, is not that it's a masculine side that that needs to be addressed it is the shadow side side of shakti that needs to be addressed because all of that is also shakti and so um so it's it, it doesn't matter whether we are men or women, uh, you know, all these shadow aspects are still Shakti, whether we are male or female. And so the the aspect of the divine feminine coming into the, you know, the role of the divine feminine in terms of cultivating um, better world is one of cultivating the light of Shakti, which is a you know all the different uh, collaborative kinds of uh, qualities, and the 
the beauty of the divine feminine or the beauty of the feminine in general is that it is it doesn't it's not about the individual and and so this this obsessive uh you know um uh, attachment to the individual. For instance, when I first came to the U.S., I would hear people say, uh, think about number one. You <laughs> have that. to think about number one. Yeah. And it didn't really make sense to me. I'm like, what is number one? I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> but it's a very highly individual kind of thing. You know, everybody is looking out for themselves. Right. And that is, we think that's the masculine side, that left-brained, hyper-dominant, uh, go-getting, e efforting kind of a thing. We we assign that to be a masculine quality. But in reality, it's the shadow of Shakti. Mm. So, um, what we need to develop is the light of Shakti. And and so then the individual is part of the whole, as Kali shows us in her iconography, where everything is interconnected. And so when we, the more we align with that, we understand that there is nothing that a person in Nairobi is doing that is not going to affect me. You know, them taking a sip of coffee is going to affect me in um, uh, imperceptible ways. So we are all connected in, in, in this web and not just the earth, the whole of creation. And um, and so when we, the more we step into her light, the more we kind of step away from that uh, aggressiveness and that, uh, you know, the violent aspect, which is, as we talked about, the shadow of Kali. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it seems like the more unified we become, the more we appreciate the oneness or the wholeness of life, the less we could stand to, um, to defile the environment or uh, you know harm other people in any way whatsoever because we're really defiling ourselves or our, it's, it's yes you know the, the Amazon is our lungs and the rivers are our blood and um, you know we, we're, we're kind of spoiling our own nest by <laughs> I mean it's obvious. yeah 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 and and you know in in the Sri Vidya tradition um, the you know we think of the goddess uh, where ev the creation is her body Exactly as you said, you know, the Amazon is, is our lungs. So that's exactly how we visualize the Devi, which is, it's hard to visualize, you know, this, this, all of this is her body. And so uh, that's why this devotion is so important, because it's like, you know, when you're devoted to something, you are less likely to defile it. It's yeah. like I'm so devoted as a mother to my children is uh, that their highest good is always, you know, my, my, <clears throat> goal and you don't have to think about that it's instinctual and yeah you know and it be, what we were just saying becomes instinctual too you know the sort of appreciation of the what was it Vasudev Kutumbakam I think it said the world yes. is my family yeah. It, it, yeah. it's not just a, a you know a nice little concept it becomes your your kind of intuitive your innate, way of being your visceral yeah. way of functioning you know yes yeah. exactly and and that is the the real you know the real essence of the path of the goddess is is that developing that that softness and you know that's more of that parasympathetic activity mm -hmm. and uh, that that a surrender and that and that being okay and it, we're kind of conditioned to work through effort and you know it's like go 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 get what I want mm -hmm. at the cost of else so just surrendering all of that in softness and sweetness is is really her light. Yeah, and when you think about it, you know, if we maybe if we equate goddess, the goddess with nature itself, <clears throat> the, it, nature is a huge, powerful, invincible force, which is conducting nature in the biggest sense, conducting the whole universe uh, in in its minute detail yeah. without an effort. Right? Yes. And so yeah. you yeah. use the word surrender. If we can surrender to or al align ourselves or tune ourselves to that intelligence of nature which i believe is embodied by all these mahavidyas then yes. then they then brahman becomes the charioteer then they become the driving force of our life and we can just sort of relax in the chariot and enjoy the ride <laughs> yeah and 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 the you know the the ironic thing is it's already always the case it is right they are driving it anyway it's just we think we have control right. and so we uh, keep interfering with the, their attempts to drive <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Good. 
Okay, well, I think we're about done, uh, although we never we could be never done. And uh, as I was reading your book, I was thinking, you know, this is one of those books where I wish we could kind of take a month and read each paragraph and then discuss it, and read another one and then discuss it, you know, but that's not really quite the purpose of an interview. So <laughs> uh, the interview is sort of a, a taste or a sampling. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed talking with you, and I'm sure we'll be connecting again. Are you, are you going to sand in the fall? I hope so. Good, I'll be there. Yeah. And you mentioned yeah. you might even come to Fairfield at some point, so that'll be lovely if you come to Fairfield. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'd love to. I'd love to come. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I encourage people to check out this book. I, I really learned a lot from it and, and really enjoyed it. Um, it. I'll have a link to it on Kavita's page on batcap.com. And, um, and then your new book is, is more about health, you said. Well, actually, it's it's about it's called the heart of wellness, mm -hmm. and it's about the heart here refers to awareness, okay. the heart, the that, the that great being heart. the essential, the, the most important component in in wellness of wellness. Yes, and and how do you bring medicine and spirituality together, and uh, how do we define how what happens to our relationship with health and with disease uh, when you enter the heart, yeah. and and so. That's that's really what that book is about. Yeah, and I would say even if you end up getting a disease like Ramana yeah. did, for instance, you know, people would say, "Oh, Ramana, you're suffering." And he says, no, "I'm not suffering. You know, this this isn't touching me." <laughs> yes, exactly. So you know, that's what I. Uh, that's really the the crux of that is suffering is optional because you know in traditional medicine we equate disease with suffering mm -hmm. and and you know as you talk about you know papers and stuff and we we uh, look at academic papers where they say you know we have decreased disease and suffering and i would back to defer, defer and say we've decreased disease but not necessarily suffering yeah. <laughs> so uh, two different things and yeah. um yeah so that's that's really delving more into you know, how do we get there? You know, enter the heart of wellness um, and through principles of Ayurveda and yoga and Vedanta. So that's what that is. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed speaking with you and um, we will do it again sometime. Um, thank you. Yeah. So <clears throat> just to make some general concluding remarks, I've been speaking with Kavita Chanayan, MD. I'll be linking to her website from her page on batgap.com and um, you can go there and see what she's up to and get in touch probably and um, you do some kinds of oh, do you do anything remotely with people aside from your local practice as a physician do you do spiritual satsangs or consultations over skype or do you offer retreats or any of that kind of stuff <clears throat> Yeah, I do actually. Mm -hmm. And I have a course coming up on Shakti Rising mm -hmm. where we will be exploring all the Mahavidyas. It's online. a 12-week course. It's all online. Right. And um, it's it's coming up. It starts um, end of February. And it's a 12-week course. And um, and then later this year, I'll be doing a course on the, the heart of wellness. Mm -hmm. And then I have some mini courses uh, just before Navratri, you know, do the uh, whole Navratri uh, course. And then um, retreats and intensives and workshops okay. and later this year uh, uh, you know i'm planning a uh, shakti yantra, uh, yatra actually uh -huh. going to india to specific shakti pitams and um, really practicing with the deities at those places yeah. so it's yeah. funny this image just came to me you know because you do all these things here you are this you know medical doctor and then you're doing all these courses and you have your own spiritual practice and this and that i kind of pictured you as one of these deities with four or six arms, you know, kind of doing all this <laughs> stuff at once. <laughs> I don't know how you manage it all. You got the teenage daughters and the whole <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> writing, writing yeah, books all the time. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's Shakti doing that. It's, yeah. the, it's your creative flow. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Alrighty, well, thanks. Um, and uh, those listening or watching, uh, you're probably familiar. You probably watched my interviews before, but if you haven't, um, go to batgap.com. And if you want to uh, sign up to be notified of new ones, just click on the little email notification link. Um, sign up for the audio podcast if you like to listen to things while you're commuting and stuff. Um, <clears throat> there, you could also subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's always helpful. The more subscribers I have, the more seriously YouTube takes me. <laughs> and helps me um, so uh, do that if you haven't um, and we'll see you next week
Thanks, Kavita. Thank you.